And the reason I tell you that story is because I sense that spirit in this room and in the people I've met since I've been in this community, that there's clearly money for joy, but there's also in this community and in this room especially, something in the budget to give away. In fact, a lot. So that when I say I'm not only honored to be in Dr. Hayes' company, I'm honored to be in yours. This is the beginning of a new year. Uh, we have a long way to go, and I thought maybe it'd be useful to talk about some things that are very, very fundamental, that every one of you has experienced or heard or knew and may not be aware that you're carrying this around with you and may not have thought about it. And I want to get into this by telling you a story that I want to use as a reference that involves these chairs, which are the same chairs you're sitting in, actually. And this has to do with the time in my life when I was teaching a, an odd combination of courses in a high school in Seattle, Lakeside School, which is where Bill Gates and Paul Allen went to school, and some very interesting, very bright young people were there. And I offered a course called Art for Turkeys because I was teaching philosophy and drawing and writing in combination. So the course Art for Turkeys was for people who thought they had no talent, could not draw, but wished that were not the case, who wished they could draw. And you had to be a senior. And the qualifications for the course is you had to be able to find the classroom and be able to tie your shoe. <laughs> and if you had those skills, I could help you. I knew what they did not really know or think about was that being able to report with a line on paper with a pencil what you were seeing was a skill you could acquire if you were a reasonably intelligible and intelligent and functional person. It's just a matter of concentrating, like using a computer, driving a car, any other skills. It takes a time. For a while, you can't do it. But if you have some training and you learn to see, not to draw, but to see, to notice the world that's there and not the one that you project or imagine, this is what the beginning of drawing is about. And from that, you can build a philosophy. So they would come thinking, there's no way I can do this because still for them there was the notion of you're born with God's talent, you can draw or you can't. And the first thing we would do was to do this. I would have the chairs set up in a room and I would say, set the chairs up to play musical chairs. You've all done this. I would imagine that very, very few people in this room who have not, from a very early age, played musical chairs. It's a game, it's fun. These are students who were taking advanced uh, physics and advanced French and who were doing all kinds of incredibly high-level intellectual exercises. And when I said, let's play musical chairs, great. Relief from the day, sure. So they'd set the chairs up. Nobody ever said, how do you do this? Or how do you set the chairs up? They did it, you know. And then you put on what? Stars and stripes forever. And here everybody goes. They're marching around. This is light. This is fun. Good time. Music stops. The deal is, get a chair. But there are not enough chairs for everybody, because somebody's taken away a couple of chairs, and so now there's a scramble for chairs. <laughs> and the, the game changes like that. All of a sudden, there's this focus, whatever it takes, get a chair. And the nice people, the, the really polite, good people of this world who do not want to get violent over the chair, are immediately out of the game. They are, <laughs> you don't count anymore. You have to go stand against the wall. You are a loser. <laughs> and the pained look on these people's faces at age 17, 18, realizing they still weren't smart enough to get a chair. <laughs> and everybody else remembers now. And the deal to get a chair is that whatever it takes. If you have to knock somebody down, if you have to throw a chair, if you have to step on your best friend, get a chair. And it really gets violent. I was amazed. Uh, we had 
Well, in the later years I was doing this, we would have some guys from the wrestling team who would get really serious, but they weren't counting on how vicious some of the young feminists could get. <laughs> and the next round, the chairs would go away and everybody's moving like this and throwing and whatnot, and people would sit down and there was this great sense of fierce animosity going on. I got a chair, they didn't get a chair. And finally we'd get down so there was one chair, and almost invariably, the kid, either the, the really militant young feminist or the wrestling guy, would sit in the chair and do this. Ah! This, I think it's one of the most obscene gestures in the culture anymore. I, I hate this so much. It's about me, it's about the chair, I got it, I won. And there's this bizarre state of mind where the person who got the chair thinks that the people back here who did not stay in the game, admire and respect him for his accomplishment. <laughs> it never occurs to that person to turn around and see the loathing that's coming off the wall or how much in contempt he is held. And I would wait and then I would say, as I'm doing now, set the chairs up, I say, let's play again. No. Why? Well, this is no fun. This is this is ugly. This is, I mean, these are very articulate kids. They would talk about this is violent, it's stupid, it's mindless, and who cares about getting a chair anyhow? This is, this is insane. They wouldn't, we were not going to play. And I said, well, suppose that we change one rule and play again. Like what? Well, like if you don't have a chair when the music stops, sit down in the lap of someone who does. She got it. She's thinking about the possibilities of this. Yeah. I mean, you could see people smile and think, oh, this could be a great opportunity. Whose lap would I like to sit in? And suddenly there'd be this graciousness breaking out. Music go along, no, you take that chair because... And I am not kidding you, not making this up. Every time I ever did this, we had chairs left over. And even better than that, nobody left out. Nobody was a loser. In fact, it was kind of confusing of what was winning now, sitting in somebody's lap or having the right people sit in your lap. But clearly it had something to do with having people in people's laps. It was a lot more fun than being up against the wall or on the floor. And no matter how many chairs went away, we would still have people figuring out how to get into a heap on a chair. Sometimes it would all tip over all fall until finally there would be one chair, everybody's still in the game, there's lots of laughter, and now the question is, because I'm pushing this, the game has to go on, we have one chair. Sometimes they would try to get the person who got the chair the first time to sit in it now, because they would all love to sit on him. <laughs> but they're usually too smart for that. And there'd be this puzzle, because I would, having done this before, I would say, that this can be done. You could use the chair. And then, this was the moment a teacher would live for, die for. Somebody would suddenly have a better, finer idea. And frequently, it was a young woman. And I remember this young woman to this day, who was the first one who did this, who said, look, if I sat like this, and then somebody sat on my knees, and then people sat on those knees, and then those knees, that everybody could sit down. And the chair, and she said this, the chair would be a support group for the community. Imagine having that insight, or being the teacher who was there when that happened. Yes. And though they did it, and there was this, ah, not this, but, oh, wow. And then, this was somebody else's idea, but I had seen it, and I would say, we're going to do it now, play the music, move around, then we're going to sit down without any chairs and not on the floor. Okay. So the music would go, and then we'd stop, and then here's what we would do, is stand in a circle, shoulder to shoulder, and then turn, facing backside to front side, and step in once, so people are in tight with somebody's butt against somebody's uh, front. And then on the count of three, sit down. 
without a chair. Now, if you've never seen this done or done this, you can try this at home. It needs about five people. But you can sit down and there's no chair. And the silence in the room when that happens well, is enough to satisfy the teacher and students for a long time. Change a rule. Look at the obvious in a way you haven't looked at it before. And instead of violence, you have imagination at work. And everybody's still in the game.